Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's joint member program with the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum. Uh, my name is Debbie Heslin. I am the head of marketing and membership at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum. And just so glad to have you all join tonight's program. Um, so to begin, I would like to recognize the lands of Pueblo people on which the sites of the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum stand. We recognize and honor their elders past and present and celebrate the vitality of their people today and into future generations. I offer this with humility and gratitude in acknowledgement of the need to confront the ongoing injustices of settler colonialism. And, and now for some Zoom housekeeping. If you have not already done so, please introduce yourself in the chat box. Uh, to find the chat, go to the bottom of your screen and click chat. Above where you type your message, you have the option to send to everyone or just to the panelists. Um, please use this throughout tonight's presentation uh, to send questions and we will have a Q&A at the end. Um, closed captioning is also available. Uh, to turn on, you can select the CC button at the black bar on your screen. It may be at the top or bottom, depending on your device. Um, now, it is my pleasure to introduce our presentation presenters tonight, um, Lisa Volpe and Ariel Plotek. Uh, Lisa is the Associate Curator Photography at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Uh, she earned her MA at Case Western Reserve University and her PhD at University of California, Santa Barbara. At MFA, she oversees the Ann Tucker and Quint Willauer Young Photographers Endowment, the Cherry Hurst House Fellowship, and an emerging commission project in addition to a reg regular schedule of exhibitions and acquisitions. And Dr. Ariel Plotek is the Curator of Fine Arts at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum. After eight years at the San Diego Museum of Art, Ariel joined the museum in 2018. His recent curatorial projects includes the museum's Contemporary Voices series, showcasing the work of the museum's first artist in res residence, Josephine Halverson, which is set to be on view this October. Um, so without further ado, uh, we can get started on tonight's event. And welcome, Lisa. Hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. So just give me a second. Great. I think we're ready to go. Well, it's so wonderful to be speaking with you this evening, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to Georgia O'Keeffe Photographer, an exhibition partnership between MFAH and wow. Georgia O'Keeffe. Where is the sound? The Georgia O'Keeffe Museum. Um, advancing. There we go. Um, this exhibition was the idea I pitched as a possible future project when in 2016 I was interviewing in Houston. Now, just a bit about the city and museum that took a chance on me and this project um, because we are being hosted by the George O'Keeffe Museum. Um, for those of you who have never visited Houston, I saw a lot of you are from Houston in the chat, but if you've never visited us, why not? I promise there is something for everyone in our city and in our fabulous institution. The museum is comprised of three buildings and a school in, museums, in the museum district in Houston, as well as two house museums in another part of the city. In those buildings, MFAH houses an encyclopedic collection of art from every era of history and all seven continents. And I'm proud to say that more than half of the objects in the permanent collection are photographs. And MFAH boasts one of the most comprehensive and best known photography collections in the world. In November of 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic, uh, MFAH completed a $450 million campus redevelopment program, opening the stunning Nancy and Rich Kinder building in which we are trying to tell new stories about the history of modern and contemporary art. And that is the exact energy and purpose I brought to this exhibition. I was thrilled to be able to say something new about one of our most beloved art icons. 
And I truly believe that seeing and understanding O'Keeffe's photography helps us see and understand all of her art and the artist herself a bit better. The exhibition, which opens in Houston on October 17th, features more than 90 photographs by Georgia O'Keeffe, most of which have been generously loaned by the O'Keeffe Museum, more than a dozen comparative paintings and drawings, it's all separated into four sections, and hopefully will give you a new perspective on one of the most famous modernist artists. Now, even without the more than 400 extant images taken by O'Keeffe, photography would still be a major part of her story. Family photographs and snapshots taken by friends mark O'Keeffe's earliest decades. In later years, of course, she formed relationships with photographers Marjorie Content, Laura Gilpin, Elliot Porter, John Candelario, and Todd Webb, just to name a few. But, of course, no relationship was more important to her than that with the gallerist and photography impresario Alfred Stieglitz. Stieg O'Keeffe was integral to Stieglitz's photographic activity, however. She designed and hung photography exhibitions at Stieglitz's gallery, wrote about photography as an art form for his journal, and during her summers with him at Lake George, which you can see here on the left, she kept track of Stieglitz's photographic equipment, spotted his prints, and mounted them. Stieglitz first photographed O'Keeffe in 1917 and continued to photograph the artist approximately 330 more times over the subsequent years. I have been much photographed, O'Keeffe deadpanned. It was after Stieglitz's death and the complex settlement of his estate that O'Keeffe began to practice photography for herself and on her own terms. For the artist, photography offered the opportunity to render anew the elements of the world around her and reassess their formal and expressive possibilities. I first went to New Mexico to see the photos at the museum in 2017. And Ariel is going to give you a little bit of an insight into how they entered the collection. Yes. Yes, thank you, Lisa. Um, well, it's, it's a story that involves um, the Alfred Stieglitz uh, and his estate insofar as uh, when O'Keeffe had the experience herself of settling uh, Stieglitz's affairs from 1946 to around uh, 1949, it, I, I think, made her um, better understand all that was involved in the, um, in the inventorying and the, and the cataloging of an artist's um, work. And, oh, it sounds like I need to speak more directly into my mic. Um, I, I was just saying that, uh, that O'Keefe had had the experience of settling uh, Stieglitz's estate. And so she knew better than most um, what was involved in uh, sort of preserving an artist's legacy. And I think this was very much front of mind when it came to, um, to her own uh, life and her own work. And so the, um, the photographs uh, that O'Keefe uh, took were in amongst the many um, hundreds, indeed thousands of photographs that O'Keefe had preserved uh, during her lifetime. Um, this included many photographs of O'Keefe herself and um, but alongside other, uh, other works on paper and, um, and indeed, you know, a whole sort of um, an archive of material that, uh, that passed to the O'Keeffe uh, Foundation when this was created after her death. And so the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum didn't open its doors until 1997. And, um, and at that time, we, uh, we collaborated closely with the, with the foundation and uh, they made available to us uh, essentially sort of um, copies of all of the photographs that were then in, in the foundation's hands. So this allowed um, the museum to begin to, to research um, some of that material before any of it came to us. It was only in 2006 that the entirety of that photo collection that was with the foundation passed to the museum when the, the foundation itself was actually dissolved and, and the museum took over um, some of the duties of essentially sort of managing the, the George O'Keeffe um, estate. And so, so for, the, for a long time, these photographs have been known to exist, but um, had never really been examined very closely. 
They were part of this very large photography collection. And it wasn't always easy, as I'm sure you will uh, be mentioning, Lisa, to, to distinguish the photographs that have been taken by O'Keefe from those that may have been snapped by, um, by friends, including uh, her friend Todd Webb in particular. And so, um, so there was this sort of, there was a sense that there was something there, um, perhaps, you know, a, a buried treasure, uh, but no one had really, had really dug in until you began doing your work. Yes, I definitely dug in. This is uh, one of my snapshots from my uh, first meeting with the photos. I like to call it my uh, first date because we would go on to have a much longer and more intimate relationship. So I think date is in fact the best word for my introduction to these photos. Um, at the museum, they were carefully arranged into these binders with accession numbers written below. However, almost none were dated. And as Ariel mentioned, it was in, unclear if in fact they were taken by O'Keefe. Some like these looked very much like O'Keefe's drawing and paint, drawings and paintings with their familiar subject matter, careful attention to composition and detail and rendering of light and shade as form. Others, however, were more of a mystery. This, this subject matter could have really attracted anyone's eye. And in the collection, there were many photos by many other artists. So as I flipped through the binders in that first date, I started to worry if this was a project I wanted to take on, if it could be done. And that's when I feel that O'Keefe herself sent me a small sign. We got to this picture. And I knew this was a project that could be done and needed to be done. So do you guys see it yet? Do you see that sign? How about now? Let me zoom in a little bit. Clearly reflected in that window is O'Keefe herself with camera in hand, taking a photo of her beloved Abiquiu home. O'Keefe left us other breadcrumbs to follow on her photographic path, including in her 1976 Viking Press book. And Ariel's gonna tell you a little bit about this book. Well, well, the book really um, was, a, was an autobiography um, of, of sorts. Uh, I would call it a sort of um, an illustrated autobiography, but it's truly uh, an artist's autobiography in that uh, what it presents us with really are a, are a series, a selection of paintings and O'Keeffe's recollections of how those paintings came to be. And, um, and I say recollections because this was actually a book that was prepared when O'Keeffe was uh, nearing her 90th birthday. And so it is an opportunity for her to, to reflect on um, a life of work and, um, and in some ways sort of, uh, let's say, uh, tell her the story as she wished it to be um, to be known and remembered. Uh, and it really is one of the, it remains in fact, I, I would say alongside O'Keefe's correspondence or letters, one of the very important sources um, when it comes to our understanding about what, um, what O'Keefe thought about her, her own work. Absolutely. So if is in fact a book about how this incredible artist wanted to be remembered, then isn't it significant that next to the seductive painting Road Past the View, one from 1964, that's a terrible image, I apologize. Um, O'Keefe included the following text, the two walls of my room in the Abiquiu house are glass and from one window I see the road toward Espanola, Santa Fe and the world. The road fascinates me with its ups and downs and finally its wide sweep as it sweeps toward the wall of my hilltop to go past me. I had made two or three snaps of it with a camera. It's just incredible to me that this anecdote was written into that book with limited text covering an entire 60 year career. In these lines, O'Keefe writes photography very clearly into her own story and into the story of her art. It's her camera, her familiar subject matter, her photographs, 
and her interpretation of the world. Other breadcrumbs could be found out there in the world. Um, there were seven, in fact, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Seven photographs by O'Keefe had been sitting in the collection given as gifts in 1977. The official credit line is anonymous gift, yet common knowledge around the museum is that they were a gift of the artist herself. O'Keefe was working closely with the Met at the time of the gift on the exhibition and catalog, Georgia O'Keeffe, a portrait by Alfred Stieglitz. So for the next several years, I traveled across the country, stopping in Santa Fe many times, trying to see every photograph that may have been taken by O'Keeffe and trying to seek out others buried in archives and in dusty manila folders. Some were clearly hers. O'Keeffe's snaps from Hawaii are her first significant body of photographs. So how did she get to Hawaii, Ariel? Well, it's a great story. Uh, she was invited, believe it or not, by the Dole Pineapple Company to, um, to paint a painting that was going to be used uh, as an ad. Um, uh, so I just, I love to imagine some sort of, you know, madman having had this great idea that they would send O'Keeffe to Hawaii to uh, paint them a picture. And, um, and O'Keeffe, in fact, spends uh, three months there, and it's a very productive trip. She paints a great deal, um, paints everything, in fact, except for uh, pineapples. So it was only when she got back uh, to, to New York that they had to send her a, a plant to her studio, and she finally delivered the, the commissioned painting. But uh, alongside the, uh, the sketches she makes and the paintings that she executes are some very important and interesting photographs. Yes, absolutely. And these became really fundamental in the research because there was no question about the attribution of these photos. As we see, we see O'Keefe standing in the exact same spot these photos are taken. She talks about um, this camera being present at this moment. She brings them home with her. So we knew for a fact that these were hers. And so it gave us a starting point to understand O'Keeffe's relationship and her work in photography. And really, it comes down to something I've called reframing, which really isn't that clever of a phrase. Um, but I just wanted to get across the idea that with each image capture, O'Keeffe would change one little thing or let something be changed in the image. So here you see this incredible lava bridge and that rock on the left just changes positions a little bit with each subsequent image capture. And what she's doing is just trying to find the best arrangement of forms within the frame, which is something that's very familiar in her work generally, as Ariel will tell you. I mean, that is something that we, we just sort of find her doing time and again. I think of it sometimes as O'Keefe thinking as a photographer um, at a time, you know, that long before she had very much experience uh, behind the camera herself, she had, um, she had served uh, as Alfred Stieglitz's um, model and muse on hundreds of occasions. She was, um, you know, their circle in New York included, um, included other photographers whose work influenced her as well. And uh, so when we think, for example, of the way that O'Keeffe sometimes enlarges her subjects, seems to be painting uh, close up views, if you will, of some of her flowers. It is, it's very tempting to, to think of that as really a, a sort of photographer's approach to composition. Are we back on track? And this is something that she learned from a particular teacher of hers? Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. So in particular, there was, uh, you know, a, a, among the many people who, um, who influenced uh, O'Keefe along the way, the, um, the, the writings and, and in fact, the teaching uh, directly because she, she became a student of um, Arthur Wesley Dow really need to be uh, mentioned and sort of highlighted. Now, um, Dow was an artist himself. 
he was primarily uh, he, he primarily worked on paper, and um, but he actually took some took some photographs as well. Um, and his book on composition was was a very important source for O'Keefe um, when it came to uh, her own approach to, uh, to to drawing and and photography. And really, I would see I would say uh, her approach to to seeing uh, to looking, and um, and so. What we, what we have is someone who I think in, in many ways, in, in, in Dow's case, really um, opened O'Keefe's eyes and, um, and made her return to her own art um, with a sort of um, much more, uh, what we think of now as a kind of a, a modernist uh, sensibility. So taking on the influence, for example, in particular of, um, of Asian uh, sources, uh, not least uh, Japanese printmaking. This is something that had been, uh, you know, an important source for European artists since the end of the of the nineteenth century, um, and that was and uh, that was something that the Dow also wanted his students to uh, to examine and um, to consider. For example, the way that a painter could compose using um, black and white. Uh, what the what the Japanese um, uh, term for, uh, for this was no time, um, what we th sometimes think of as sort of chiaroscuro, um, the play of, uh, of, of, of light and dark. And, um, and so it was possible, whether working with chalk or pencil, for an artist like O'Keefe to begin to think in these sort of black and white terms um, before she herself had ever picked up a camera. Absolutely. And you see her kind of rehearsing some of those things she learns from Dow um, very early on in her photographs. Um, but one of the ways she significantly parts ways with Dow is even though that concept of Notan, that light and dark are very important that you want to have these balanced forms of light and dark in the composition, Dow actually thought of shadows as inconsequential, as fleeting effects, and that you shouldn't pay any attention to them. Well, O'Keefe did not do that. Um, dapples of light and these dark shadows were not fleeting effects to O'Keefe. Instead, they became forms that were as weighty and essential as mesas and mountains in her work. And O'Keefe used these forms of light and shade to reframe. So she photographed the same view throughout the day, allowing the shifting shapes of light and shadow to reframe the scene and create different compositions. This is evident in her photos, and it helped me appreciate it a bit more in her painting. Well, and, and this is um, this again is one of these sort of uh, fantastic uh, parallels that, um, that that Lisa, your work is able to present between the uh, a beloved subject like the the patio door, um, which O'Keefe returns to time and again in her paintings, and um, in fact, the way that she works this way sometimes in series makes me think of uh, of another sort of um, modernist. Um, tradition that begins perhaps uh, you know with the with the impressionists in the in the 19th century the the practice of painting in series and of observing the same motif um, at different times of the day in different weather and this is certainly true of the of the patio door and um, what we see on the on the left that photograph is um, is a perspective that's a little unlike the one that O'Keefe most often paints but it reminds us of um, how the, the form of the patio, the fall of light, this play of, um, of sort of opening and closed spaces, uh, the way that our eye is drawn um, through that doorway, that all of this was, um, you know, this was, this was what she wanted to, um, to explore in, uh, with, the, with the camera. And that although it may not have been identical to the, um, images she was composing with uh, with the brush, 
it was it was always sort of um, it was in the service of the same uh, the same project I would say the same kind of the same mission. Absolutely. And another example of the similar mission between uh, painting and photography is her interest in seasonal change. And we see that not only in the case of a, of a view like this one, uh, this river view, but for example, in the way that she paints time and again, the, the cottonwoods, those, um, those trees that, um, that are a sort of favorite subject of hers that she can observe from her, her bedroom window um, at, at Abiquiu, for example, down along the banks of the Chama River. And maybe it's because of my background in, um, in European modernism, but I think, for example, of the way that Monet paints um, the poplar trees again and again, there's a sort of late motif. Um, I, think of, I think of the, the, um, the cottonwood, which is closely related to the aspen being, uh, being a sort of, again, a touchstone for O'Keeffe. Absolutely. And those trees, which you see out her bedroom, you see she, right she here. That very few. Yep, she photographed it in all seasons and really allowed the naturally changing foliage and the varying light to reframe that scene for her. So you see it in summer and winter and spring and fall, really in all seasons. And of course, uh, no exhibition of O'Keeffe's work would be complete without images of bones and flowers. Um, I kept joking internally with uh, our institution that we had to have them or people would complain. Um, but they conform to O'Keeffe's interest in light and shade. In the case of the bones, she always thought of the bones in relation to something else, such as the sky. And in the case of the flowers, it was about the seasonal cycle, um, the blooming, the opening and closing throughout the day, and that interest in looking closely and appreciating nature. So I have introduced you to O'Keeffe Photographer, and that's kind of how you would experience the exhibition, um, walking through the galleries. Um, that introduction, just talking about her beginnings in photography, introducing you in the second gallery to the concept of reframing, moving on to light as a method of reframing and seasons as methods of reframing. But I wanna back up now. I kind of wanna push pause and um, turn this around. Um, most people ask me when working on this project and learning a little bit about it, how did you attribute the photos? And a large part of this project was about determining definitively that the photos going on the wall were indeed by O'Keeffe. So the full answer would take all night as each photo was different, but I'm going to speed through some of the means and methods of attributing and dating these photos. And then you'll get a little quiz at the end to see how you do and to see if you can um, get into that mindset of O'Keeffe photographer. So because we could firmly attribute the Hawaii snaps, I had a foundation to work from, a way to understand her photographic approach. And that was reframing, moving slowly, trying to find the best arrangement of forms. But there were many photos at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum and many others out there in the world that might have been by O'Keeffe that demonstrated something like reframing such as these images right here. So how could I say definitively that the photo on the left is by O'Keeffe and the photo on the right was not? And then on top of that, how could I date it? Well, in short, I wanted to be able to put the camera in O'Keeffe's hand at the exact time and place image capture happened. With every single photo, I relied on a two point system. I had to have two facts, I had to confirm with two facts that it was absolutely her photo. Whether it was handwriting, paper, location, process, I was always looking for my two points. So first, I built a massive timeline. <laughs> so reading and referencing 
all the letters from 1950 to 1970 at the library in Santa Fe, those at the Beinecke, and at other archives such as Laura Gilpin's in Fort Worth, Marjorie Contents in New York City, Francis O'Brien's in Arizona, I began to fill out a timeline of O'Keeffe's movements. And we know she was a prolific writer and she would always note her location and something about her current activities and her correspondence. So the timeline grew and grew from the letters. But then they grew, it grew and grew even more once I started to really study the photographs. Those photographs led to new and essential timeline elements. For example, do you see how different the adobe looks in both photos? really worn and cracked on the left, very smooth and has these very clear tracks on the right. Well, I learned the exact months and years that she had the mud adobe redone until in 1959 when she switched from mud adobe to cementous adobe. And after some help from Jeff Pappas, New Mexico State Historic Preservation Division officer and nationally recognized architectural conservationist Edward Crocker. I wanted to get their titles exactly right. Um, they helped me identify what type of adobe I was looking at in each of the photos. So I could conclude if the photos were taken before or after that switch in 1959. Other things like changes made to the living room as some of you know, she expanded the windows, she lengthened the banquette, um, and all of those details went on the timeline. I put her trips to New York on the timeline and there were quite a few of them, but I cross-referenced them with the construction of the building uh, in these photos. Um, we have the Seagram's building on the left, which was constructed in the mid 50s. And some of the buildings on the right were also very telltale signs of when these photos were taken. I even plotted them on Google Maps and did kind of like flyovers so I would understand the exact location she was taking these photos from. And to make sure it conformed with O'Keeffe's schedule in the city at that particular year. Did she stay nearby? Would she have passed these places? Were these buildings even constructed yet? And thanks to my letter reading, I learned that Todd Webb taught O'Keeffe to photograph, processed her film, and printed most of her photos. So I was off to Webb's archive to see what I could learn. It's at the Center for Creative Photography in Arizona. And it was there that I discovered the letter on the left, which is Webb's order form for photographic paper. You'll see he's ordering 250 sheets of Medalist 11 by 14 number two single weight. Now to most people that is nonsense, but to Paul Messier at Yale, um, who runs this amazing archive and database that you see on the right hand of the screen, he knows exactly what that means. And not only does he know what it means, he has a sample of that paper. So I was able to beg some of those samples of those exact papers from Paul at Yale, who put together that outstanding archive. And with those paper samples in one hand and possible O'Keeffe photographs in the other, I was able to compare paper types. Is it the same weave? Is it the same sheen? Is it the same weight? It also helped me narrow down date ranges as only certain types of paper were made at certain times or as you see here on the left, the back stamping of certain photographic papers changed depending on the date. And as exciting and productive as that paper study was, it did leave one major problem. It meant that, of course, O'Keeffe's photographs were on the same paper made at the same time as Todd Webb's photographs. And here you see some of his shots of O'Keeffe out photographing near Abiquiu. Additionally, as you can see, they would travel together, they would walk out together, and they would trade cameras back and forth. I saw evidence on of this on contact sheet after contact sheet. And this is actually my little nod to Ariel because that little strip on the left, he's always really 
liked. So do you want to explain what's going on there? Yeah, I love this. This, um, this was a, a session that, um, uh, that was, that was taken to, uh, to capture the photograph of web that would be used as the, um, as, as the back uh, cover photo, right, um, on one of his own books of photography. And so what we're seeing um, in the first place is, is two photographs um, of Webb taken by O'Keefe. And then it seems that um, Webb has asked uh, O'Keefe to, to take a turn. And, or perhaps he's taken the opportunity to, to adjust, you know, uh, the, the, um, the aperture and, and sort of uh, you know, to fiddle with the camera a little bit. And uh, so she sits in front of the camera. And, and I love the fact that, that, that this, a strip like this one is evidence of exactly what you're describing. That sort of, um, you know, the, the trading of the camera back and forth. Yeah, and they did it a lot. Um, and because they were at the same place at the same time and their prints are on the same paper and even sometimes on the same contact sheet, how on earth do you tell their work apart? Um, so here you see Webb's photo on the left and O'Keefe's photo on the right. Well, this is where O'Keefe's consistency of vision in painting, drawing, photography really saves the day. So that's what I was looking for. When I needed to tell the difference between Todd Webb and Georgia O'Keeffe, it became about that reframing, that consistency of vision. So here is a zoomed in view of one of Todd Webb's contact sheets. Um, and what you'll see is a very confident photographer. Um, he goes from one scene to another. There's really not that much of that incremental change you see in that third line down, switching from a doorway straight to a landscape, straight to another landscape. And even when there's somewhat repetition, like in that first strip or even the second strip, what he's doing is he's allowing people to change the scene, but he's still adjusting the camera somewhat. Now let's look at contact sheets by O'Keefe. Do you see the reframing? I mean, it's pretty glaringly obvious. Um, that top strip um, on the right of the um, flowers and the kitten have become a favorite around the MFH offices. Um, but just that subtle change of how much shadow, how much form of light to include inside that frame. And down below, you'll see multiple reframing of a storm happening outside her studio. Now, the left is for bonus points. Um, for those photographers out there, you might immediately see the wackiness of what is happening here. Um, but if you're not familiar with making your own contact sheets or, and negative strips, you might need a little direction and that's fine. So this is a contact sheet from Glen Canyon. Um, O'Keefe and Webb went twice and she borrowed his camera multiple times. And she's taking pictures of the rock formations in those first three shots, bam, bam, bam. And then we get to a lovely little just snapshot of her friend back to the rock. Now another snapshot of her friend, but what happens is it's all the way flipped around, which means that the photographer using the camera at that moment first shot it, the first one like this, went back to the rock and then shot the second vertical like this. That is, those are not the actions of somebody who's very confident and comfortable in shooting a specific way. Um, so those little variations too, I had to really pay attention to in order to understand if, you know, it's clear that those first three are reframed and are, are O'Keeffe's, but what about those two snapshot portraits? Well, they're a little wacky. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk to O'Keeffe about that. So notably, when I went to the Todd Webb archive to comb through the contact sheets and identify O'Keeffe's images among Webb's, 
There was never any disagreement with director Betsy Evans Hunt and Sam Walker, who know Webb's work best about whose images were whose. Never a disagreement. In the end, we found about an, a 200 additional captures by O'Keefe hidden amid Todd Webb's contact sheets. So this is the point where you are quizzed. Um, I thought I'd end here. And it's a contact sheet that includes both Webb's and O'Keefe's images. And now I know that I went through all that fast, but you know O'Keefe's work. And I hope by now you can begin to tell these very good friends apart in their photographic production. And ultimately that you have a sense of what it is like to see the world through the eyes of Georgia O'Keeffe, photographer. Thank you. Ariel, you wanna? Thank you, Lisa. I, yes. You wanna I, go guess? <laughs> I, oh, shall I, shall I have my, I, I'm gonna say that the top two strips are Todd Webb. And that by the time we get to the third, we are looking at the work of Georgia O'Keeffe. All right. <laughs> <laughs> bang on, bang on. There you go. It's 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 really so interesting. I I have um I have many questions for you that I think your your presentation has raised, and I wondered also if just in the first place you could um, tell us a little bit more about Todd Webb. He's so much a part of this story, and uh, notably, he made the a, a gift of of, uh, of the probably of the camera that we see. Um, here, held by O'Keefe in that in that um, in that photograph on the left. But what was his when, when um, outside of this of these photographs taken alongside O'Keefe? What was his um, his career uh, like? Um, you're asking about my current uh, photography archival crush, so I'm very happy to talk about Todd Webb. Um, Webb. Uh, first picked up a camera um, in Detroit as part of the Detroit Camera Club. And if you are a photo historian, that's kind of ringing bells because um, that was a course that Ansel Adams came to teach. And Webb took it with his very, very close friend for the rest of their lives, uh, Harry Callahan, another very famous photographer. Um, Webb has a long and checkered past um, he was a stock broker. He was a gold panner. He went into the military. Um, but by 1948, he was really determined to become a photographer. And so his first stop was to uh, the Mecca, which was Alfred Stieglitz. And he went into Stieglitz's gallery and chatted with him and met O'Keefe, who um, the story goes, was trying to pack some work up and couldn't quite get it right because their assistant hadn't shown up that day. And so Webb stepped in to help and um, just his generosity and his spirit, she loved it from the start and they remained friends. She wrote um, a reference letter for him when he applied for the Guggenheim Fellowship in 1955 and he got it. Again, photo historians out there, Bells are going off, 55, that's the same year uh, Robert Frank got the um, Guggenheim for the Americans. So we have two men traveling cross country, Frank in a car, Webb got his grant to walk across the country. He went from New York, um, he got a bike in Kansas because he said it was too boring and flat. And for any of you who have been to Kansas, you can't fault him for that observation. Um, but by the time he made it to see O'Keefe in Habakkuk, he was absolutely wiped out. And she insisted that he stay for several weeks um, to rest and recover. And that's when it happened. That's when she became very interested in photography. And they started this photographic friendship that would continue for many years until Webb eventually moves to Santa Fe um, around 61. And uh, then they're together, together. But uh, I also, I'll stop after this comment, I promise. But um, <laughs> I loved going through the contact sheets at the same time I was reading some of the oral histories, because what you hear about O'Keeffe's chow chows 
is that they're like devilish and demons and they're attacking people and don't open the gates because they'll get out and like, it's a, it's a crazy situation. But they loved Todd. Um, these dogs loved him. And in a lot of his shots around her house, the dogs are sitting in the foreground, just like staring at him with like these adoring looks on their face. It's just so cute. So I love it. And, and uh, it's not only a rangefinder like this one that he uh, gave to O'Keefe. There was a Polaroid camera as well, wasn't there? Yes, there's a Polaroid camera um, that she gets a little later on. Um, that's a poke from her friend Frances O'Brien, who was a, a art friend since their days in art school. Um, and the absolutely fascinating thing about it that you um, talked about a little in the importance of um, black and white informing those compositions is even though she has a Polaroid, and actually the most um, prolific film for a Polaroid at the time is color film, she mostly chooses to use black and white Polaroid film, which for an artist that we know for her color work is just kind of mind blowing. Right, it's like she goes out of her way to, uh, to limit herself to the, uh, to the monochromatic. And, but we did see, I think there was one color photograph in your presentation. How many color photos are there in, in the show? There are not that many. Um, I, off the top of my head, I would say like six to eight color photographs. Um, they've also shifted, as we all know, color photographs do. Um, if we all think of just our family photos from the 70s, they've taken on that weird tint. Um, so in a lot of cases, they were of the river. And so we had to do some backwards um, reinvigoration. We had to bring them back to life in order to really understand what season she was photographing in because sometimes what looks like snow is actually just extreme sunlight bouncing off that water. You've mentioned already the, the name Ansel Adams and um, they, they met, if, I'm, if I recall correctly, uh, uh, he and O'Keefe met in 1929 when she was in Taos and he was preparing his book on the, on the Taos um, Pueblo. And, and they remained friends really for decades. Um, and and he, he invited her to, um, to Yosemite. And so I can only imagine that that was, you know, uh, must've been an, an extraordinary experience to have him as your tour guide. And uh, do you suppose that the Ansel's um, approach to photography and his own thinking about uh, well, about, about sh uh, shadow in particular, uh, had an influence upon O'Keefe as well. I'm going to say a firm, firm no. Um, O'Keefe was friends with Ansel Adams, but she had problems with his artistic output. Um, she felt as though he didn't say enough, that he didn't have a particular vision that he made beautiful images, but they were just that beautiful. Um, so for her, that's the wrong approach in art. You know, everything should be an expression of some experience that you've had. And to just make it pretty for the sake of pretty wasn't something that she found interesting. And, and um... When we look at her, her subjects, her sort of her, her favorite subjects, we've talked a little bit already about how um, they, they, in many cases, they mirror the subjects that she returned to most often as a, as a painter. Um, mm -hmm. But we don't ever think of her as a figure painter, and there's only very rare instances uh, when O'Keefe paints, uh, well, a, a portrait, for example, or even the, the, the the figure um, at all. There's a, a body of, of uh, nude uh, watercolors, but those belong to um, to a they're, they're a very uh, early group of work, and we don't really see O'Keefe returning to the to the figure uh, in that way um, much beyond those uh, those those works that were mostly uh, executed actually in Texas, and. What do you see when, when she um, does, you know, on those occasions when she trains her camera on, on a person? Do you, do you feel like you learn something about um, O'Keefe as a, I don't want to call her a portrait photographer exactly, but, you know, there are occasional portraits 
um, in this group? It is such a great question. And it's one that I kind of wrestled with. And I'm going to paraphrase one of her quotes. I probably won't get it exactly right. But even about her paintings, she said that she had painted portraits that for her had been practically photographic, but they passed into the world as abstractions and no one recognized them as such. So in her mind, she was making portraits at certain points in time. It's just that with the, um, you know, mimetic quality of a photograph, we absolutely recognize them as portraits here. Um, Re, you know, I was never able to untwist that. You know, I, I am not a O'Keeffe painting scholar, so I can't point to the paintings that she thought were portraits. I don't know. Um, but with her portrait photography, what it tells me is this vision a lot of people have of her as this like hermit in the desert who doesn't really like anyone is like so false. Um, Everyone in Abiquiu was coming to her to have their portrait taken because, you know, Todd had done it. Todd Webb did it, as you pointed out, for kind of that author portrait for the back of his books. And then, you know, one of her helpers, her driver, came to have her port his portrait taken by her in order for it to go on his record that he was making. So suddenly she became like the village portrait photographer and she was okay with it. Like, you know, she's in her letters, she's like describing that she likes it and that, um, you know, she likes taking these portraits of Todd. So it's a whole different view of this person, you know, wanting to photograph her friends and do a really good job and like hold them close in that way. It is one of the wonderful things about the about the photographs um, of O'Keefe taken by Todd Webb is that you do sense the that intimacy of, the, of their friendship. And uh, and I've often not not only is, is uh, Webb one of the few um, photographers who gets gets uh, shots of, of O'Keefe in her, you know, in her dungarees and her in her jeans when she's not sort of dressed for the camera, but also um, these wonderful uh, photographs of O'Keefe smiling. You know, it's a it's a very sort of it's very disarming sometimes to um, to, to come across these and to be reminded, as you say, that O'Keefe may have um, may have presented a sort of a very you know a, a cultivated even a fairly stern uh, persona. And um, in, in many of her, of her portraits, beginning with those taken by Alfred Stieglitz, uh, but there, there are other sides to O'Keefe. And I think that Webb's photographs really reveal, uh, reveal that in a wonderful way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, their friendship and the openness of it really shines through in those photos. And photography generally seemed to be a way by which she reached out to people. Um, in the, you know, 10, in 1910s, she's writing to different friends and asking them to send her, you know, Kodak snaps of them at that moment. Um, and then when she starts producing her own photographs in the late 50s, um, she uses them as postcards sometimes and writes on the back of them like different messages to people referencing the image on the other side, but asking them to come visit. And so, yeah, photography generally, whether it's Webb's photos of her or her photos that she's sending out into the world, like show this very warm side of her. Lisa, I see we had a question here about um, whether there was a, a book that accompanied the exhibition and there is indeed a catalog. And can you tell us in particular, uh, maybe speak to the to the work you've done uh, compiling what is effectively a sort of catalog raisonné, you know, an effort really to um, bring together all of the known photographs uh, by Georgia O'Keeffe? Yeah, absolutely. So there is a catalog. Um, it's been published by Yale University Press, and it will be available at the start of the exhibitions. Um, I wrote an essay, Ariel wrote a wonderful essay, and then in the back is exactly what you're describing, a kind of a catalog raisonné, a census of all the known images, photographic images by O'Keeffe. So all of that hunting that I've done, 
is all there. You'll get a little thumbnail, a little description, dated, any information I have about the photo, um, the type of paper it's on since that was so essential, any writing on the back. Um, I should note on a lot of the photos, there are thumbprints, there are ink and paint stains, and on quite a lot of them, um, there you'll see the term in the book, um, minor skinning at corner, corners on verso. Uh, that's a fancy conservator term that means there was tape on the back of them at certain points in time. And we all know when you put tape on something and then you rip it off, it kind of leaves that like fuzzy square. Um, so she hung these up somewhere at some point in time. They were taped to something. We just don't know what. And so I've indicated really every bit of detail that I have on each of the images, each of the photos, um, all 409 of them that I've been able to find out there in the world. And I'd like to just say as a disclaimer, I know there are more. <laughs> We've got to start somewhere. And I hope that this is just a starting point for future research. Yeah, we had a question as well about uh, negatives and whether any prints were made for the exhibition. Um, no, uh, we didn't make any new prints of any O'Keeffe work for the exhibition. Um, they're all vintage prints, mostly from the O'Keeffe Museum. Those seven are coming from um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. There's one coming from the uh, Boston MFA. Um, but no new prints. We um, do have some newer prints by Todd Webb of Georgia photographing. So you see the lovely cover of the um, catalog here on your screen, and there's a new print of that. Um, he didn't print some of the images of her photographing, like we saw her at the river, we saw her in her courtyard, all of those photos of Todd photographing her photographing. Um, so those were printed um, by the Todd Webb Archive for the exhibition. I wonder if, uh, are there any questions? I, I've been trying to, to sort of track um, the questions that are coming through in the chat, um, but are there any that, that I, I've missed maybe? I see we're, we're getting near um, our time here. Debbie, did you have any for us? Um, no, it looks like you got most of them, and there was one earlier question, um, just crediting one of the paintings, I think, of the Chama um, from, from a slide deck earlier. So if, if that's ready available, if not, we can send that information along to you, Karen. Thank you for that. And um, I have to ask you, Lisa, because this is often asked of me. Is there a favorite uh, photograph or a favorite subject of yours in the exhibition? Oh, the dogs. I mean, dogs. I became, I became obsessed with the dogs. Um, I think, and I've passed it on to the museum now, I think I have built the official lineage of the Chows, like I traced their lineage. Um, we know that she had eight. Um, but we, you know, the dates of when she owned them and their exact names were always, were always a little fuzzy. You know, she liked the names Chia and Bo a lot. So there were, there were three Chias, there were two Bows, like it becomes a lot. Um, but the, the dogs are so fascinating to me because, I mean, I could pick up my phone and show you 200 cute photos of my dogs right now, but she saw her dogs in formal terms, I'm 100% convinced. When she wrote about them in her letters, they are these dark spots in the bright New Mexico, you know, sunlight. When she goes to the Armorillo State Fair, she talks about how the animals are such nice shapes. So the dogs become this interesting formal element in a lot of her photographs. They're like weird negative space black holes of fuzz. Um, so yeah, the dogs, I'm into the dogs. It's so great. Even when, even when a, um, even a doting uh, you know, dog lover like O'Keefe is first and foremost an artist maybe and still sees, <laughs> and still sees the, the animals as you say, you know, they're more than just, than just her friends. They're also these, they're these kind of um, 
this fascinating subject. Always, yeah. always close to hand, I would, I would imagine, as well. Yeah. In fact, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, when O'Keefe's um, vision was beginning to, to fail her as it did late in life, and she was prone to, uh, to tripping over the, the dogs on, on the dark floor of the, of the studio in Abiquiu, she actually had a white shag carpet put in so that the black chows would stand out, uh, you know, in, in more, in higher contrast. Yeah, makes perfect sense when you know that way of thinking. Absolutely. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for, for sharing this with us. And uh, I know that all of us are greatly looking forward to the exhibition. Um, and those of us who, who can't see the, the show will um, perhaps uh, have the chance, at the very least, to consult your catalog. And tell me, the, the exhibition is traveling as well. It is. It's traveling to all the, the places you see on the screen. Um, <laughs> so hopefully you can catch the, catch the exhibition at one of them. Um, but it opens here in Houston on October 17th. Wonderful. And members get to see it first. Um, uh, so if you are an MFAH member, you get to see it first. And, and in fact, let's take this opportunity to thank uh, the members of both of our museums. Uh, you know, it really is your support that makes uh, so much of what we do possible. So, so thank you for joining us uh, this evening. And, um, and thank you, Lisa. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, guys. Bye now. <laughs>